Maybe that's your pr prayer on this morning that you just give yourself away, not your neighbor, you. I'm, in, I'm, I'm seeing an, an image of an old army recruiting commercial. Some of you already know where I'm going with this. It was a picture of Uncle Sam, and he had a finger pointed like this, saying that the army needed you. And God is recruiting soldiers in his army on this morning. Amen. Will you give our praise team one more hand clap of praise? If that was an indication of what heaven's angels sound like when they're singing, holy, 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 I'm glad that I got an opportunity to experience this morning heaven on earth. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious eternal God, our Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you breathe the breath of life into us on this morning. We thank you for your grace. Truly, it is sufficient. We thank you for your mercy, but truly they are brand new each and every day. We're not worthy, but we thank you that you sent your son who is worthy, who died for us, washed away our sins, and made us whole again. We thank you. And Father, we thank you for the spirit that is moving in this place right now. Holy Spirit, have your will, have your way in the hearts, the minds of your people. And Lord, I just thank you now for the opportunity to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't take it for granted that I stand in this sacred place. So Father, I give you all of me right now not my will, but your will be done. All of you, we give you praise, we give you glory. In the mighty, the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Anybody need a word on this morning? Amen. Amen. See, they're already putting the pressure on the brother. All right. I hadn't even opened up the Bible. They're already putting the pressure on the brother, talking about come with it. But you know what? I love my brother. What a brother's that? Yeah. Ladies, did y'all hear the bass in the house? Yeah. Yes. Thank God for the brothers on this morning. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It's found in a book that is seldom ever preached. But when you hear the text, It'll be a familiar text, and I think it's applicable for our service on today as we celebrate our youth that are going to the next phase of their lives. But at the same time, this word will speak collectively to the body of Christ. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 14 you have it on the screens, but I want to read on the screens. You have the English Standard Translation, and I know it's looking really small. I can't control the fonts. <laughs> it was big when I sent it, <laughs> but technology has its way of doing what it wants to do. So for your hearing, go back and read this in its entirety. For your hearing on this morning, I'm going to read verses 1 and 13 because that is really where the crux of the sermon will be coming from. Again, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1 and verse 13, and this is a King James translation. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, 
nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now go to verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. This is the word of God for the people of God on the, work, on the day of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. For the time that we have together, this morning I want to share with you from the subject, warning lessons from the king. Warning lessons from the king. About a year ago, I was driving along in my whip. On East 6th Avenue. And I had my music going. I didn't have my drop top down, but I had my music going. And it was praise and worship music. My wife was seated in the passenger seat and you all know my background, I'm a state trooper, so I really don't pay attention to post the speed limits. I'm just saying what I'm saying, I keep it real. And so I'm rolling along, and I'm minding my own business in the left lane, what we call the hammer lane, and there's two cars in the right lane, and I'm like, eh, you're going too slow, I gotta get to work. So I speed up in the left lane, and I pass up those two vehicles. Beknownst to me, about a half a mile up the road, was some of Aurora PD's finest. So you already know where the story's going. There were the warning signs posted saying the speed limit was 40 miles per hour. Unfortunately, when they stopped me, I was going 55 miles per hour. And that's where we find ourselves today that there are warning signs all around us, but we get so distracted, we don't pay attention to our surroundings and we miss the warning signs. This morning I want you to Go with me now into the text because King Solomon has some warning signs for us as the church collectively, but also individually today. Are we still together? Yes. Walk with me in this text. So we have King Solomon, I'll give you a little background. King Solomon, he takes reign over Israel. Now, historians and theologians believe that he was probably around 17 years of age when he took over as the king of Israel. The Jewish um, historian Josephus says that he was probably 14 years old. And I brought that to your attention because young people, you find yourself in this text this morning. Amen. 17 years old, 18 years old. And as the text progresses, you will find yourselves in the text as well. Now at the age of between 14 to 17, he's not going to the next level from high school to college. He takes over as king of Israel. Amen. Around 17 to 20 years of age, he's taken over of king of Israel. Now when you read the story of Solomon, he, he's given credit for three books. In the book of Ecclesiastes, you will not see his name mentioned in the book. But when you go back and read chapter 1, it gives us clues that he is the actual author of this text. It says that he was a son of David, and he was a king of Israel. Well, when you do the genealogy, that eliminates everybody with the exception of Solomon. So when Solomon writes the book of Ecclesiastes, it is in his latter years. When you go back and read Proverbs, Solomon writes this book early 
in his reign as king. He's probably around 20 years old. And what I like about it was that when he's reigning as the king, in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, it says that he was making a sacrifice. He has a vision from God, and God asked Solomon what gift he wanted. Solomon did not ask for material things, but he asked for an understanding heart to judge your people. Amen. Not his church, right. not his people, your people, God's people. We as leaders, we don't own anybody. It's God's church, it's God's people, regardless of your position in the title, it's God's. That's the lesson. And he says that I may discern from good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked him this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. So early on, Solomon shows us his wisdom by asking God for wisdom. He, he's giving him his heart. He's not asking for material things, but he's giving him wisdom to make decisions. And when you look at the book of Proverbs, there is wisdom throughout. Now, fast forward, in his young adult life, he writes the, the Song of Solomon. If you haven't read that, gentlemen, I, I recommend that you, that you read that. See, the ladies already know what time it is. I'm trying to help you, brothers. I'm trying to help you. It is a poetic love story like no other. So, brothers, you might want to read that book. That, that is the young version of Solomon. But by the time we get to the text on this morning, Ecclesiastes, it is in his latter years. Now, when we look at the text, you have to go back to chapter 11, verses 9 and 10, to bring it contextually into uh, place. So in verses 9 and 10, you have Solomon, the preacher, the teacher, who is also a king. He's given them uh, a retrospective look of the things that he's done in this past. In essence, he says, when you're young, you're going to do young things. Enjoy life. Get the best out of life. All that life has to offer you, get the best out of life. But if you get the best out of life and don't include God in that, he says that it's like a vapor or a mist. Can you grab vapor? Can you grab mist? So that's what he said, that life without him, you're missing something. But life with him, there's the fullness of joy. Life with him, you receive the promises of God. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. You are the lender and not the borrower. You're blessed going out, you're blessed coming in. For me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Like, there are so many things that God gives the believer when you put him in your life. As a matter of fact, Matthew 6 and 33 says it like this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All, not some, but all these things will be added unto you. So if you want a prosperous life, if you want to live a life that's full of joy, not happiness, because in order for you to be happy, things have to happen. But joy, that's something on the inside of you. You, you can take away my car. You can take, take away my house. Come on, somebody. But at the end of the day, I still got joy. 
You can take away all of my prizes, all of my possessions, all of my awards, all of my accomplishments, but as long as I got Jesus, I still got joy. As a matter of fact, when I think about Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul boasts in the Lord. Because, why? Because I still got joy. Somebody is reading their Bible. So we see the old Solomon writing this text. Now, remember, I told you that Solomon was a wise person in his younger days. But Solomon did what we do, if, we, if we're going to be real with ourselves. Every now and then, we get so comfortable that we feel like we don't need God in our lives. We got it all figured out. All our bills are paid. All our needs are met. Your spouse is, um, how can I say it? Behaving. I have to remember we have young folks in here this morning. Uh, marriage, marriage has benefits. And one of the benefits of marriage is intimacy. Solomon was married, but he didn't have one wife. Brothers, how many of you can say one is enough? <laughs> Solomon had 700 wives. I'm in pretty good shape. But 700 wives? And if that wasn't enough, he had 300 concubines, uh, young folks. That's a chick on the side. 300 concubines, and the brother is now having a retrospective look to say, I did all of that, and I'm at a position now where all I could do is think back and wish I could get a, a re-over or a do-over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Because he realizes that at his age where he is now, he's telling you enjoy life to his fullest, but don't make the same mistakes that he made. He's the king of Israel. He's got it going on. He's got 700 wives. He's got it going on. He's got 300 concubines. He's got it going on. As a matter of fact, here's where he went wrong. He began to give his heart to his wives and his concubines. And they were pagan wives and concubines. They served idol gods. And then they began to sow into his heart. And instead of him doing what he knew was right, what was right, he began to do what his wives wanted him to do. And see, that violates God's divine order because God placed man as the head of the household and not the woman. Now, I know that's not popular in today's culture, but the, the, the word of God, that, that is not me. That's God's word, and, and, and we are a church that believes in God's word, right? Uh, am, am I right about it? And, and so the beauty of that is when the man loves Christ, the wife doesn't mind following the husband. But we find Solomon falling into a trap by serving idol gods because that's what his wives wanted him to do. Now he's looking back at this saying, I made some mistakes and I don't want you to make the same mistakes that I made. So when we look at it from that perspective, God made intimacy or intercourse for a husband and a wife. Anything outside of that violates God's order. How many of you know that uh, there are consequences to your choices. 
Uh, sex outside of marriage, that's fornication. You're married and you have sex outside of marriage, that's adultery. And when you look at it, sometimes the consequences of that can be fatal. You can catch a sexually transmitted disease, that's one way, but if you continue to do that, you think you're going to heaven, but because you violated God's law, he says, depart from me, I know you're not. So God is a God of order. He places order in the house. Lessons from a king. Are we still together? So when we look at lessons from the king, the first lesson that we look at is found in verse 1. And that lesson is, remember your creator. Remember your creator. I know that sounds simple, but don't read too fast. Remember. It, it, it translates into placing your heart, placing your mind that you didn't create yourself. The creator created you. Yes, your mother birthed you, but the creator, he is God. He is Elohim. In Genesis 1 and 1, it says, in the beginning, God did what? Created. created. He is the creator. What did he create? The heavens and the earth created man in his image and in his likeness, and then he said it was good. So when we remember, it means to properly mark, to recognize, to build an altar in your heart, in your mind for God, the creator and the sustainer of life. So lesson one is to remember the creator, the one that uh, created the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the oceans, the lakes, the grass, the birds, the fish. Creator, God, he created all of us. As a matter of fact, the psalmist says it like this. In Psalms 8, 3 through 4, he says, when I consider. Anybody considering anything? He said, when I consider, when I think about your heavens, the work of your fingers, the potter, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? Remember your creator. Now, that was lesson one. Lesson two, we can go to verse two and find that lesson two is verses two through six. Verses two through six. Remember, I told you that you're going to find yourself in this text. Now, let me give you a little more background. This is called an allegory or a poem. Solomon is writing this poem or this allegory where there are symbols, similes, metaphors, where when you read it, it's just like Jesus speaking a parable, but Solomon is speaking a parable in the Old Testament through allegory language. So when you read verses two through six, I'm not gonna read those verses, but I'm gonna explain to you what he said. Now I covered the, the 17 to 20. This is the 40 and up crew. Th these are the baby boomers, Generation X, Generation maybe, kind of getting there, Generation Y, but definitely the baby boomers and the Generation X. So if you are 60 and under, you're going to fall in this category. Um, if you're 45 to about 59, you're going to fall in this category. So when you read verses 2 through 6, this is what he's saying. Uh, somebody say the clock is ticking. Yeah, I, I think that's what the slide says. Yeah, the clock is ticking. Uh, I got about 13 minutes, so let me, let me fast forward here. Uh, before, you, before you get weak, your arms and shoulders, they're stooped over. Now, I want you to image, see the imagery here. 
There's a lot of imagery here. He says, before you get, this is verses two through six, before you get weak, your arms and shoulders are stooped over. Before your teeth fall out. Some, some folks got dentures in here. Mm -hmm. uh, before your eyesight fails. Uh, I'm, I'm wearing glasses. I'm, I'm in that category. As, as a matter of fact, I, I, I got a little surgery coming up. Um, before you lose your appetite. I don't know if that one falls in everybody's category because, you know, <laughs> some of us might need to fall in that category. Uh, be, before, before you, uh, if, if you can't say amen, just say ouch. Before you lose your hearing. Huh? What you say? Huh? Some, I'm, I'm, I'm just telling you, everybody's going to fall in one of these categories. Before you become fearful about many things, having anxiety, being oppressed, being depressed, before your hair turns white. That's what he means when, it, when you read, it says the almond tree. When the almond tree blooms, it turns white. Some of us prevent the grace, so we <laughs> just shave it off. Yes. So, somebody's got some dye color, hair, hair dye. Yeah. But your hair is white. Before you can't walk very well. So here's the imagery. Your shoulders are stooped over, your arms are dragging, and it gives reference to a grasshopper. That's the image. That's the image. He's telling you that he's walk through these things and because of life and some of the decisions that he's made, this is the, the, the consequences of those bad decisions. Now, I just can't leave you there. Let me help you out. So what we're going to do today, we're going to watch our diet. We're going to count our calories. We're going to look at labels to ensure that we're not getting too much sugar in our diets. We're gonna make certain that we get at least eight hours of sleep. We're gonna make certain that if our job is stressing us out to the point where it's gonna kill you, you might wanna go look for another job. Because it ain't worth that. They don't pay you that, that much money that it's gonna stress you out and cause you to die. Um, when you look at where you are now, this is what Solomon's saying. He's giving you warning signs of life. And if you continue to go down the same path of life and don't pay attention to the warnings, you're going to end up like Solomon. What do I mean by warning signs? Um, your heart begins to patter really fast. Your heart rate's going up. More than likely, you're about to have a heart attack. That's a warning sign. Um, you're driving your vehicle, and on your uh, dash, it says, warning, low fuel. If you don't heed to the warning, you're going to be like we used to be back in the day. See, young people, y'all don't even know what that is. That's hitchhiking. You, you're walking down the road, and you're hoping with your thumb out that somebody's going to pick you up. That's a warning sign. Your engine says, check engine oil light. If you don't put oil in the motor, guess what? You're going to burn up the motor. God has given us warning signs today from Solomon telling you, if you don't do what God is telling you to do, there are some consequences behind that. Now, we look at the third lesson that he teaches us, and the third lesson, since you didn't get it the first time, he says, I'm going to say it again. Remember now your creator. Y'all got that one? You, you don't need me to go over that one again? Everybody's got it. Remember your creator? We got that one. All right, so then 
he fast forwards verses 9 through 12. The fourth lesson that he teaches us is the wise preacher. The wise preacher. Now remember, Solomon was a king. But when he writes this, the, the word Ecclesiastes, ecclesia, he's, he is the preacher that is writing to the church. And so today, God has placed me in this position as the preacher, and I am verbally or orating to you what the text is saying. And in this particular text, Solomon is giving us a warning sign saying that you need to heed what the preacher is saying. The scripture says, faith comes by and hearing by the word of God. How can one hear without a preacher? Uh, what did you say? Preacher. So brother, sister, preacher, when we get up here in this position that God has placed us in, we have to do as Timothy was taught by Paul to study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. You know why? Because God is going to hold us accountable for what you receive. Amen. And so when we look at it, Paul says, preach the word. This is Paul exhorting Timothy. He says, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Does that sound familiar? Are we not in the latter days? Is there not a falling away of the church? Where now we got the pastor and the first man? Hello, somebody. Uh, if, if your doctrine is not preaching Jesus Christ was crucified, buried, resurrected, and ascended into heaven, that's a false doctrine. Um, a lot of that is going on right now. He says, he continues, he says, they will have itching ears. In other words, you're not preaching what I want to hear. So I'm going to go somewhere where they're preaching what I want to hear. That, that, that's itching ears. It's appeasing you, but we all know that the word of God, it cuts you what? A two-edged sword going in and coming out. So if every Sunday you coming in and, and everything is hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm not doing my job. No, I, I, I have to hold you accountable and you have to hold me accountable. Why? Because iron sharpens so we have to hold each other accountable. But then Paul continues to exhort Timothy. He says, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions. Ouch. How, how many of us really want to endure afflictions? No, we, we want life to be good. We, we want the best of life. We don't want to endure afflictions. But I got good news for you. The psalmist says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God will deliver you from them all. He is shaping you. He is molding you. He's a potter. We are the clay. And if we don't go through afflictions, that's long suffering. That's the fruit of the spirit. Then we're not worth the salt. Lost off what? And, and I don't like bland food. I want something with some flavor, with some taste. So we have to do the work of the, of, the, of the evangelist to make full proof of thy ministry. And we fast forward. Again, these are lessons from the king. Warning lessons from the king. Lesson number five, he tells us to fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. We're not talking about Casper the ghost fear. Ooh, scary movie. No, none of that. Fear God means to reverence God. Um, my father was a World War II veteran. He was a pastor. And y'all know we got a big family. I'm not going to even tell you how many. It's big. But my father and mother, 
they were disciplinarians. And whenever we would do bad, my mom, she put the fear or the reverence of God in me. And you know what she said? When your daddy gets home, some of y'all had the same daddy I had. When your daddy gets home, he's going to put that belt on you. That's the kind of reverence or fear that he's talking about. You fear God, but not afraid of God. You reverence God for who he is. Fear God, and then he says, to keep his commandments. Keep his commandments. Exodus 19 and 20 gives us an example. <clears throat> Excuse me. Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. There that word is again, the reverence of God, that when you are in a position to sin, the fear of God causes you not to sin. It's that fear where it's like, I don't want to displease my daddy. I don't want to do anything that's going to separate me from God because that's what sin is. It is the separation from God. So Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning, to reverence God. We are not afraid of God, but we are to fear or reverence God. Then he gives us the second part of that. He says, to keep God's commandments. John 14 and 15 says it like this. If you love me, you will keep my And then Jesus continues on in the same chapter, verse, chapter 14, verse 24. He says, he that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine but the fathers which sent me. So if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Lesson number six, and we'll close out. Lesson number six is the judgment. The judgment. Solomon has given us this epilogue to his life story. And he gets all the way down to verse 14 verses 13 and 14, and he says, let us hear the conclusion. That means this is the end, the conclusion of the whole matter. Everything that I just told you, everything that we just walked through, the first 12 verses, it all boils down to verses 13 and 14. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, to fear God, keep his commandments, but this is the whole duty of man. Because at the end of the day, when you don't fear God, when you don't keep his commandments, when you don't give your life to Christ, there are consequences for everything that you've done in life. And, and the word of God says, says it like this. 2 Corinthians verses 5, or chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. Therefore, we make our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are all well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciousness. So he gives us a plan that when the judgment comes, we will have eternal salvation. Romans 3 and 23 says it like this, for we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when you sin and come short of the glory of God and you don't give your life to God, there's a judgment after that. So young people, as, as you get ready to go to college, as you begin to take that next step in your life, remember the things that your parents taught you. Remember the things that you learned here in church. Remember the things that you learned in the classroom. 
Remember the wise counsel that you have in this book? Remember the sayings that Joshua said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He will not let this book depart out of our mouths, that we will meditate on it day and night. Remember those things, but remember this one because it's so critical for where you end up in life. God has purpose, God has plan, and he has a destiny for each and every one of you and each and every one of us. He has called all of us to do something in life. And when we follow his plan, he gives us the promise of eternal life through Christ Jesus. Lessons from the king. Gives you the warning signs. If you don't adhere to the warning signs, the consequences of that is death. But after death is the judgment. And the judgment for those that do not accept him as their Lord and Savior is eternal damnation or hell. But I got good news. For Lottie Dottie and everybody, that if you accept him as Lord, you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. You shall have eternal life. You shall receive a crown of glory that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. And if you receive that word this morning, give me a hand clap of praise. God has an eternal plan for each and every one of us. And that eternal plan is very simple. I just gave you the plan of salvation. Now we extend that invitation to you just as Solomon did to the church, to those that he was writing over 2,000 years ago. Those same promises are, are true for us today. Maybe you're in need of prayer. Maybe you haven't given your life to Christ. Maybe you're seeing some warning signs. Maybe that text spoke to you. But if you're going through those physical ailments, I am here to tell you that God is a healer. That imagery of the grasshopper with his shoulders, God can make you have your shoulders squared up, hold your head up, poke your chest out. He'll give you new life. Because his word lets us know that he is Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Maybe you're going through a financial difficulty right now. I'm here to tell you that God is Jehovah Jireh. He is the provider. He will meet every one of your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. My prayer for you this morning is that when you entered into this house of prayer that you will not leave out the same way that you came that god's word resonated in your heart in your mind in your soul and you're encouraged to know that as long as i got king jesus i don't need nobody else the invitation has been extended we're waiting on you this morning. If God is speaking to you, will you come? Will you come? Will you come?